do you want to do like a cool like YouTuber intro? Like, hey guys, what's going on? It's it's no. it's bones. <laughs> <laughs> I am very much so not that person. Jeff, we're going to talk about video games and stuff, I guess. <laughs> this is an excellent intro, and it only bodes well for the future. It's only up from here. Hey, you have to start somewhere, right? You have to start somewhere, I guess. And today's topic, I guess the topic, I don't know, subject, discussion, I'm talking about Pokemon, because, you know, everyone plays Pokemon. I've been playing since I was a kid. I'm sure Crow plays a lot of it, too. Brand new news about the Pokemon Scarlet and Violet are the mm-hmm. two new ones. Yeah, so we're going to talk about Pokemon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's funny because Pokemon is one of those topics that I think has touched pretty much everyone in the gaming industry. Like, mm-hmm. I don't think you're a gamer unless you've either heard or played Pokemon. Like, yeah. I mean, I, you, it's really hard to find somebody that hasn't played. I, I think I think the newer generation of gamers will struggle a little more to relate because the the craze of Pokemon in that in the late '90s when the first set came out was just so insane. Mm-hmm. everyone played Pokemon, everyone knew Pokemon. It was the Fortnite of 1999, I guess you want to call it that, because like all the kids played yeah, it. I can see that. Yeah, I can <laughs> see that. I was thinking of like fandoms and stuff. I was like, I-, I feel like it's almost the biggest thing since like Super Mario Brothers, like, or just Mario Brothers in general. Like, I- I'm trying to yeah. think of like anything else, like besides maybe Legend of Zelda. Like it was probably like that kind of level of fandom. Well, actually, I think I think that the Mario franchise is the most profitable franchise. It might have I mean, changed with sense. Pokemon. Yeah, that's but the true. Two are up, the two are up there as like the most profitable like game franchises of all time. Mm-hmm. But like, just it it, it it was such a different time for video games because nothing had ever gotten that crazy before. Like, sure, we had Mario that was popular. We had a bunch of classic games that were very popular for that time, but nothing nothing quite grasped the 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 youth the the young generation like pokemon and maybe it was because of not just the games but you know the trading cards and the tv show and the figures mm-hmm. and all the merchandise oh they but... went full throttle with it like they yeah. they made the they made the series like as profitable i think as they could have in absolutely the time. so it's like i remember just like just, i was little when they they were what 94 or something like that when they came out i can't even remember now but i remember being like super young and playing on my game boy because we i want to say i was still living in new york at the time and we used to travel to 96 okay yeah so i was I just moved to New Hampshire. So we were in the process of like living in this new house that my parents were like rebuilding. And I remember just kind of like sitting off into a corner and playing Pokemon. And like my, my older siblings would be playing, you know, games on their Super Nintendos and and stuff like that too. And I remember just kind of retreating into the corner on my like Game Boy Pocket or Game Boy Color, I think it was. And it was still in kind of that monochrome color. So it didn't really do much for me anyway. But yeah, I remember just being so addicted to it and I loved it. I mean, I probably didn't fully understand it because I was probably like, what, six, seven years old Mm -hmm. at the time. So it was definitely something that was just kind of fun to play. And I didn't really have to feel like I had to understand everything because like, my older siblings were playing games that like I didn't really understand at my age. So like this mm-hmm. was kind of like my thing, cute creature things <laughs> I can collect. And it was just, I loved it. It just kind of skyrocketed from there. I I don't know why I got Pokemon because I was, so, so so the original Red and Blue came out in America in 98. So I was six-ish, about the same age as you. I had an N64 and I don't know if I ever showed any interest in Pokemon. I might, have, I might have watched a TV show when I was a kid, but I remember for my birthday, I got a Game Boy Color and I got Pokemon Blue. And I was just taken by that game. Again, same thing. There was no color. It was either blue or gray or like yeah. the <laughs> like the off-white g- green mm-hmm. of, of the LCD screen. The monochrome screen. hell. <laughs> but like I played, I played that game so much and then my mom got me Pokemon Yellow when that came mm-hmm. out and I was balling. I was obsessed. <laughs> I was obsessed with Pikachu at that point. I, like I, I was had so everything. I was so amazed. I have a Pokemon follow me around, even though there's only one Pokemon. I was like, "That's just so cool." Yeah, I can, my, <laughs> my, my Pikachu can follow around everywhere. Hell yeah! yeah. And just I, like Ash too, because you can't evolve them. Yeah, and I was just like, I was like, I'm so glad. Uh, I was actually really happy that you couldn't evolve them because I wanted it to stay a Pikachu regardless. Like even if I had the choice, it would have stayed as a Pikachu the whole time because <laughs> I was just, I was so excited about it. And it was, and it was so silly because it was basically the same game. Just with like 
you know, an slight addition of differences. Features. Yeah, just a slight difference. And I was just like, I'm obsessive over this. And, you know, I think that's also kind of tied into the fact of like why the games have kind of brought in a lot of profit because you can have red and blue and yellow. They're all basically the same game, but you have mm. to have them all. And yeah. that's like this, and it, you got to catch them all. It's like yeah, the it games was that. as well. Well, I think, I think it was also that and just the fact that you could have blue and I could have red and mm -hmm. we had to trade and interact and be social yeah. to get the other Pokemon. I was not social. I had two games <laughs> on <in> that court. <laughs> well, okay. I had to be social. I wasn't that cool. But I think I think that was a smart move on Game Freak's part to make it into separate games. Because for, first off, you're doubling the profits. Let's yeah. be honest here. You're making twice the money for, for one game. Mm -hmm. But those, those slight differences made it so that you could own that game like i i like for me it was pokemon blue that was my jam i got friends who were like fuck you pokemon red for life like that's just how it was, <laughs> was team it, blue as well <laughs> yeah <laughs> like that's how it was back then and and it continued a, as the the games went on but it was just a i don't know if it did as well as games got older as a, as the games evolved but like the just the the marketing idea of hey let's split into two things to to give players a reason to communicate and a reason to play more, mm -hmm. I think was a really smart mechanic on their part. Yeah. And I think like just looking at it kind of going into the future though, do you feel that it got a bit old? Cause I think as the, the generations came out, I remember like silver and gold and, and what was it pearl and diamond and all the emerald and sapphire and all the, I, mm. I think I almost got tired of it. I got tired of like, it felt very money grabby after I grew up. And I was like, kind of in this like boat where like, I like Pokemon, I kind of want to play it, but I don't want to like <laughs> feed into this like corporate, like, you know, that sort of thing. So it was, it was kind of a battle as I like kind of experienced some of the later generations. Cause I think none of the other generations have held and captivated my attention. Like, and I, and I noticed that kind of over the grand scheme of things, I have like a lot of the game, I think I have like gold and silver on my Game Boys and I've got, you know, X and Y and, and all of those, but I didn't feel that same connection that I did from the original games. And I don't know if it was just because it felt repetitive or if it was for that I just didn't feel connected with the Pokemon of that generation. So do you have any input on that? Just kind of like how you felt kind of going through the generations? I, and this is going to be a, a, a hot take. <laughs> I think Pokemon peaked with Crystal. Okay. Now, now let me explain right to, to the, to the <laughs> list. All right, let me explain to the listeners because a lot of people really, really enjoy was it em Ruby Sapphire Emerald? They, a lot of people think that was the peak. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you about Crystal, okay, listeners, people at home. First off, you get a brand new Pokemon game. You get the whole world of Johto, brand new region, all these new Pokemon. It's a great time. This is the first Pokemon, Pokemon game that has animations in the battle, so the Pokemon move around and stuff while they're fighting, and not just like a little. Ugh little dash forward yeah but like they do a little screen thing shake. <laughs> yeah the little screen shake like the pokemon actually like do a little move they, like the, mm -hmm. the sprites dance around it had the first day night cycle of the pokemon series having pokemon be all caught different ways because you have headbutting pokemon rock smashing pokemon wild pokemon cave pokemon fishing all the kind of stuff mm -hmm. and not only that you had an entirely second game afterwards because you go through you beat the eight gym leaders you do the main storyline you beat the elite four and it almost every other Pokemon game, that's it. Mm -hmm. You might have, like, what is it called? The Battle Tower or things yeah. like that. Yeah, like Pokemon additional games. small, like, but, what yeah, it's just, kind of it's like just grinding. Context, You're just grinding right? at that point. Yeah. But but Crystal, you have the entirety of Kanto, the first Pokemon region, to go through again mm -hmm. with the same gym leaders, but updated, a little more storyline to it, and, and tougher fights. So the game continues all the way on to, I think the game caps out in, like, level 75 or so for Wad Pokemon. Mm-hmm. Like yes, you can get your Pokemon like to like nine, but like it capped out at like seventy five for NPCs, so which was which is good. So you get so much more value out of it. And then I don't know for me, like every other Pokemon game since then just has never captured me quite the same way. And I've played a, a pretty good portion. I I think I played all the Pokemon games all the way up until Diamond, Platinum, Pearl, the which was the first DS one, and then I skipped Black and White one and two, and then I played XY, and then. I think there was one between that. There was Sun and Moon, wasn't there? Or I never played Sun and Moon. I think there was yeah. two of those. There's Sun and Moon 1 and 2, I'm pretty sure. Okay. 
Yeah, I and have then... Sun, and I never played it. I, you know what? To be fair, after you explain that, I realized I've never actually finished Crystal and Pearl. <laughs> I, I actually really enjoyed I came, so I, I left after, I, I did get gold and silver, like, when they first came out, because I was just, like, so hopeful for, like, the same kind of energy that we got from that. And I, and I don't remember finishing those either, because I just, it didn't feel as, like, authentic, I guess, as mm -hmm. the original games. And then I had put it down for years. And I want to say I picked it back up. I was with an ex of mine and we were just like, we get, we got like three DSs from like GameStop or something cheap. And we ended up buying it and we caught up with all the games. And I actually really enjoyed black and white and X, uh, X and Y. I think I played a little bit, but I definitely enjoyed the black and white and black and white too. Mm -hmm. I actually really enjoyed those because it, it offered a very different graphic style, I think. And that kind of drew me back in for a little while. And then I think after that, I fell off again until sword and shield i think was the next one or let's go let's go pikachu i think was the next one that i had gotten and and so now that we've mentioned the dark times let's let's, let's cover the the modern pokemon games mm -hmm. uh, which is kind of kind of why we're here so it it is in my opinion and it, this was this is why i wanted to do this for the show pokemon hasn't changed a whole lot since since we were kids and it's kind of not great <laughs> I agree. And I think we're seeing, I think that's what has caused me to like not finish any of the recent games. Mm -hmm. Like I, I bought Shield, I think when it first came out, I want to say, I think I paid full price for it. Like right when it came out, I was yep, excited same. about it. And I just like, after the first gym leader, I just like lost my all like attention span for it. It just, it wasn't engaging in the way that I had hoped for a new age Pokemon game. Yeah. So for me, I hadn't played a Pokemon game in a while. And I picked up Pokemon Let's Go Eevee when that came out because I, I knew ahead of time it was not going to be the strategic, in-depth RPG Pokemon experience. I knew it was going to be dumbed down and I was fine with that. And you know what? G getting to relive the nostalgia of playing, you know, Pokemon Red, Blue, Yellow on my Switch was pretty fun. And then Sword and Shield came out and I was like, all right, let's see if they can take that formula and make it for a more mature audience. Because again, I'm in my late 20s at this point, you know, I only have Pokemon since it came out. I'm hoping the franchise and mechanics can evolve to something new. And it didn't. But Sword and Shield, super basic. And it wasn't a matter of like the gameplay is basic, because I know the Pokemon gameplay is gonna be you're just trying to you're just trying to match types. I get that. Yeah. Same with like Fire Emblem or any other RPG, you're trying to match different different stat bonuses, whatever it is. But there's just so much more design space that comes along with what you can do in this sort of like turn-based RPG. And it just felt like Game Freak just phoned it in for Sword and Shield. And I played the entirety of Sword and Shield, I didn't, but I, I didn't do the DLC, but I went through the entire the main game and the, the base game and nothing, nothing was there where I was like, wow, that was an iconic moment that I remember going through and been like, that was amazing. Like I can tell you how cool it was when I was playing Pokemon Silver and getting to see a Lugia for the first time, like going to investigate like the caves and find a hidden Pokemon there. And you're like, whoa, oh my God, that was so cool. There's none of that in, yeah, there was in nothing, Sword and There's Shield. no wow factor to it. Yeah. And that's like, and I went back to it afterwards. I want to say I picked it back up maybe about six months ago and I actually finished the base game. I didn't play the DLC either because there wasn't enough in the base game for me to want to buy the DLC. Exactly. And I think that that's really important too, is like the DLC should not finish the game. It should enhance the game. And for all we know, there could be that, you know, magic egg in the DLC, but they've already lost me for that, that particular uh, game because the original game was just not as engaging as yep. I think we all hoped. I mean, that was that was a major release in a long time because Let's Go Eevee and Let's Go Pikachu was a very different style of game too. And it was, it was also on down, the heels. Yeah. yeah, it was also on the heels of Pokemon Go and all of that as well, too. So that's a whole nother we'll get into that in a minute. But <laughs> uh, yeah, I think it just it it had this opportunity to just like pull in not only us as like millennials and, and stuff like that, but also pull in the Gen Zers and all these new, you know, all these new players that could love this game. And I'm not saying it flopped. It's not a bad game by any means, but I think they definitely missed their mark of what I think they could have done. Absolutely. There was just such an opportunity to bring it to a more mature audience because this is also the first Pokemon, the first mainline Pokemon game to not be on a handheld system. Which you know the Switch is kind of handheld, kind of handheld. Kinda, it's like half but, and half. <laughs> but is, this this is this is the the flagship console of Nintendo, right? This is mm -hmm. all they have right now, and this is the first time we're getting like a, like a full AAA non mobile only title for Pokemon mm -hmm. in a mainline series, and is just the same as the last gen. 
and I was just so frustrated with it. I, was, I just felt bored the entire time. Sure, some of the Pokemon designs were cool. Some of them are kind of phoned in. Don't get me wrong. Uh, just to interrupt for a second, I think every generation has had a phoned in Pokemon or two. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I was Almost about to say, if you haven't does. checked out some of the new Pokemon that have released with the with the updates or the news about Scarlet and Violet, those, some of them look a little special. <laughs> uh, I, have, I haven't seen a whole lot. I've seen the starters and I've seen the pig, LeChonk, which everyone Oh, you're loves. missing out on Smoliv. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, the all, yeah. The little, I did see that. I did see the olive too. But yeah. like, there, there's, a, there's a keys. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's someone's house keys. That's a Pokemon. <laughs> I'm not it's, kidding you. That's when you know you run out of creative when you start yeah. looking around you to see what you can find and turn it into a Pokemon. It was just someone's keys. There, there's like, oh, we got, we got to get an idea. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Hey, they don't lose their keys. <laughs> We're here. We got it. It's the idea. That's it. Like, yeah. come on. You can do so much more. I mean, to be fair, let's let's think about this in the grand scheme of things. This game has been around since the '90s, the late '90s. Yeah. There are so many, like, there, there's so many generations and so many Pokemon in each generation. I don't blame them for phoning in a couple of them. Oh yeah, to absolutely. Totally. <laughs> they're, they're... There's only so much balance to the human imagination. I think. How many current Pokemon are there? Oh, probably like four, <laughs> four or five. Oh, look at that. Google auto-completed for me. <laughs> I was trying to type in <laughs> how many current Pokemon are there across all... 913. They, they oh, got some wow. space. And that's, I guess I'm, I'm assuming that's not including Scarlet and Violet yet. This says 898, whatever. Okay, there's around 900 Pokemon. Some 900, yeah. So, like, they, 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 got, they got an excuse, right? You oh, can't, yeah. Absolutely. You can't always have a winner. But, man, they phoned in a couple of them. Hey, guys. If you're like me, I wear a lot of hats. I do a lot of work. I, I work from home. I run the podcast. I run Chasing XP. I stream on Twitch. I do a lot of things. And that's not counting social life, cleaning my apartment, taking care of my pet, you know, all kinds of stuff. And honestly, I get really stressed out working on these kinds of things. It's it's a lot to do for one person. Life is a lot to do for one person. But I found this, I found this little drink called Magic Mind that's really helped me take out the edge off while I'm working. It helps me stay less stressed, it helps me stay focused while I'm working, and a bunch of other cool benefits too. If you know me, I don't really do caffeine. It's not my kind of thing. I get the shakes, I get the jitters, I get headaches really bad too sometimes. The most I normally drink is either like black tea on occasion, or maybe I'll have some coffee flavored stuff for once in a while, but nothing really serious. I just can't do caffeine in large quantities. But with this drink, I get the energy boost I need, and I don't get any of the, the downsides of these, like, big energy drinks. I don't get shakes, I don't get jitters. I feel great the entire time, and there's no crash either afterward. This drink comes with a lot of really cool all-natural ingredients, as well as Nutripix, my favorite one being ashwagandha, uh, which is proven to help uh, reduce stress, which is, again, a big thing for me, because I do, I'm really stressed all the time, y'all. I can't help it. Trying this drink out has changed my workload. It's changed how I operate throughout my day and it lets me get through my entire work day as well as afterwards without needing to worry about my ever-growing to-do list of things I need to do. And if you're like me, you want to try this out for yourself, which I think you really should, you can go ahead and head up to the website at magicmind.com slash XP and using our code P20, you can save 40% off your first subscription. Once again, that is magicmind.com slash XP using the code XP20 for up to 40% off on your first subscription. So, so that brings into what, what today's real topic is about. How can we take the idea and the formula of Pokemon, this monster capturing and monster battling genre of RPGs, and make it something more mature, more engaging, and something that, that fits today's game design world, where we have such better technology and ideas and aspirations and make it something better than what we've been doing since 1996. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. one of the one of the first ones I, I want to bring up is Monster Sanctuary. Mm -hmm. This is a super cute indie RPG game. It is a Metroidvania where you capture monsters and battle them in a turn-based scenario similar to Pokemon. It's not a hundred percent the same. You don't have to catch Pokemon when you fight random random monsters. You, you, they drop an egg, and you can hatch that egg and just use that monster in your team. But it has, you know, the different types of attacks and defense and whatnot. It has turn based gameplay, but it's three on three and not one on one or the occasional two on two. It's always a three versus three match. 
and it gives us this super interesting metroidvania world where you can use these monsters abilities in the overworld to unlock new areas and do things which i just found fascinating i haven't yeah. beat it yet i don't know how far i am in this game but i've got like 20 or so hours in it and i'm still having a lot of fun yeah i mean it's it's definitely when i was digging through because i i mean i do love i love creature collector games and i i'm very drawn to them just in general but this one had a very different spin. Like, we have not seen a Metroidvania Pokemon-style game yeah. ever. Like, this is this is a first of its kind. And I think they they took on a very ambitious program or ambitious idea for mm -hmm. an indie studio, let alone any studio, and really, I think, made it into something that was not only captivating, but it gave that kind of nostalgia feel of the creature collectors, but presented it in a new and exciting way that I think got a lot of i i want to say a lot of the people that i know that were into pokemon at the time when this came out they were very excited about it and they were all jumping in on it so it pulls that audience but it does it it gives us something new and exciting and i think that they've really done a great job i've played through i'm thinking i'm on like five or six hours into the game right now but it's just like just from the graphics to just the movement to the overworld skills to just how the the battle system and the skills are laid out i it's think it's so really well fun, right? oh it's it's fun and it's super well executed and that's that's really hard to find when it comes to brand new ideas. Because, I mean, you can't expect something to be perfect right out of the gate. But damn, this game is pretty, getting pretty Right? Close. It yeah, was really so good. It was really good so far. And I, I'm excited to finish it. it. It's definitely held my attention. And, and that's that's hard to do now with a lot of different types of games. It keeps it exciting and keeps it fresh. Which star did you pick for Monster Sanctuary? Which, which come on, you got to tell me. No, I'm going to keep it a secret. I'll, maybe I'll release it at the end of the show. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Well, well, I'm going to take it now. I picked the Fire Lion because it looked super cool. He did look cool. So he was my original, like, first choice. But I I, I went another direction. And that's did all I'll pick, say right did now. Did you pick the Ice Wolf? <laughs> maybe I, I picked the ice wolf he was so cool okay come on you don't want to have like a fenrir or like an arctic box i'm a final fantasy fan so it looked like fenrir. i'm not i'm not knocking it i'm not I was knocking waiting for it somebody, i knew I, the people who like know me know that i love final fantasy so as soon mm. as they see something that resembles something final fantasy <laughs> that they're like oh it looks like fenrir it's okay but That's yeah, I, I nicknamed him Fenrir, and that was basically <laughs> like my go-to. I think the only the, so so this game offers four starters. I don't know why. So there's a fire lion, which has like fire and earth skills. There's the ice wolf, which I think has water and I don't know the other element it does. Oh, why am I drawing a blank? A blank. It's hang on, I'll pull it up. Because I have no idea. <laughs> I can't remember now. It's been like a while since I've picked it back up again. Now I can't even remember. I was playing this a few days ago. It's a lot of fun. I think I'm halfway through. I just hit. I'm somewhere in the early 20s with my monster level. So I want to say it's halfway because the monster ability is capped at like 40. So I think I'm like halfway um, through. He is the I yeah the spectral wolf yeah so he does the ice and the the air sickle he does ice and like the the spectral ice and flame. air okay yeah it's like ice and air and he also has that spectral aspect neutral like yeah okay and then there's also a bird a phoenix that I don't know what I would assume it is fire and air I maybe can pull it up let's see I, then... as soon as I saw the arctic box I pretty much just <laughs> blanked out of everything because that's just how my the it's spectral also... eagle yeah so he he is fire and lightning. Okay, and then I assume the toad is Earth and God knows what. Uh, the toad's a bad option. So, yeah. so the toad's the worst option. He... Sorry, sorry, listeners. <laughs> the toad is always the worst option. We need to get a cute, like, uh, a cute toad Pokemon. Yeah, yeah he's L mud listen, and, and water. I love me I a Bulbasaur. Don't get me wrong. He's not the best <laughs> starter, but he is cute. I'll give him that. I wouldn't call him a toad, though. Like, he's kind of like, a, I don't even know. It's almost like he's a turtle because he's got thing. the bulb on the back, kind of like the shell. I don't know. Anyway, it's hard putting animals yeah. <laughs> to sit like that's a whole nother whole nother discussion. Yeah. But yeah, Mon Sanctuary, fantastic game, and and I'm still impressed by it. I just unlocked how to evolve the monsters in the game, mm -hmm. which is which is also an Italian thing because it's not level based. It's like level based plus finding certain items, which makes it a little more engaging because like, oh, how many is there a finite amount of this item and does it work for all monsters or what? I don't know how to figure that out, which I find really cool too. But going off again that too, there's like I said, there's plenty of other games in this genre. I know you and I talked before about Temtem, I believe. Do you want to talk more yes. about that? Oh, yeah. So I have a mixed history with Temtem. So I was so excited. I remember just being over the moon because I love indie games. Like that's that's my like go-to besides Final Fantasy, indie games are kind of my little other, you know, niche hobby that I love. Mm. And it was so exciting for me to see that because like not only did the art style look super cute, but it was an MMORPG. 
And that was one of the things that I was like, okay, we're bending it's a, it's rules a great now. Fusion. Yeah, and it's like if there's so, like, and that's what I love about these games. They're pushing the envelope on things that have not been done before. So like, mm -hmm. there's no other creature collector, or there may be now. Now that you know this episode is out, but at the time, that was the only one of its kind, and it was really exciting. And I think a lot of people were so kind of pumped up for it. And I remember like the just kind of the early access period and it was it was so buggy and it's and you have to understand like when you're playing an early access or an alpha game and even sometimes a beta game the game is going to break like that yep. is a given and i think i remember just trying to like contact the devs and there were so many people spamming that discord that were just like children not understanding like this is not the full game like this is just for them to figure out stuff and I think that they had gotten so overwhelmed with that. And then they just went dark. And then they recently came back out. But it doesn't have the same hype it did when it first launched in mm. early access because of that. And I don't blame them. They probably got super overwhelmed because they had so many more people play testing and alpha testing than they ever even planned for. And right. that put so much stress onto their systems. And I think it freaked them out a little bit. But it still allowed them to continue working on the game. And it just recently had, had launched, I think, I want to say it just got out of early access or it went from early access to like beta or something. Something just released recently in the last month or so, April, uh, May, June, something like that. And it just, no one's talking about it. I saw a couple of people playing it. I saw a couple of little news articles here and there, but the not nearly as much excitement as it was when it first, like, this is coming, here's an alpha test. And I think I remember when when... When you are when you and I were playing this episode, I remember us talking about this briefly, and I could have sworn this game had already come out and like done its whole life cycle. Yeah, I didn't know until recently it had just come out of come out of beta. Yeah, so I mean, it. I mean, it was in a long time. It was last year, I think. I don't. Oh gosh, time just blends now. Pandemic time is. Yeah, just, the pandemic. The pandemic. Yesterday time, was time six months ago. Did, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, like it was. It was so exciting, and it was so new, and it was just. It was something that people were talking about. And that, like, that's hard to find when you get an entire community talking about it. So not only was the indie community talking about it, people who play, like, the mainstream games were, you know, like, people who don't even, like, look at creature creators were looking at this game. And it was just, it was kind of a, just a natural phenomenon with the game, and it just kind of dropped the ball. So, like, it has launched, and I think they're still working on additional content and such for it, but it, it lost a lot of its charm, unfortunately. Yeah, I don't know. I... I remember the game came out, and I thought it was neat, and I was I was keeping an eye on it because I wanted to see how it evolved. And I forgot about the game entirely, so clearly they didn't hit their marketing marks or whatnot. How you want to define success for a video game? I'm sure they're profitable at least, but I think the impact of that game probably didn't come anywhere close to what they were hoping it would be. And maybe now that's out and completed, maybe they'll have some expansion to, to bring more life into it, but. Mm -hmm. I think at this point, it's probably going to just be another one of those, like, niche fan games. It's fun. Yeah. It's just like not going to be... Like, it's popular for, like, a day or two, and then it's gone. And and that's heartbreaking for me, because, like, I was... I remember just the pure excitement I had for this game. And and I, I'm not saying don't play it, because it is a fantastic game, and it's mm -hmm. worth getting through the content. And just the fact that you can play with other people is a selling point for me, because I love being able to play, you know, with my friends and with community members and that sort of thing, too. And it is definitely still worth a play. I think... I just think that they learned a very valuable lesson about communication from game mm -hmm. devs to players or potential players and i think that that opened up a door for them to kind of use that as a learning experience hopefully and allow them to kind of take that advice and move it into something more whether it's additional content coming to it or a full re-release or you know additional game or whatever the case is i think it was a very very strong learning moment for them but it is still a good game it's just not going to have that same massive cult following that something like pokemon would have and also, one of the things that will come into play into this, too, is it's incredibly hard to make a successful MMO. Yes. It's hard to so make a successful game. Like, not yeah. even factoring in that. Like, yeah, is, not even that. They're already doing the impossible by creating a game, let alone something that's going to be living 24-7. Yeah. Like, one of the one of the biggest things is that when, 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 when I talked to developers for the previous iteration of the show, trying to see how they want to build a, a multiplayer online community is so, so difficult nowadays with how popular like Fortnite and WoW and all these other online games are. It's such a competitive space and trying to keep servers and engaging content and end game content and whatnot for such a long period of time is incredibly hard. Not to mention just the, the steep, the steep costs of trying to make a profitable 
MMO. It's just it's just it's insane for an indie studio. Yeah. So it, I'm not surprised. It's crazy. Like I'm trying to think of just like games that have survived for so long that were like indie studios, and there's there's not that many in comparison, mm-hmm. and because they they get easily stamped out by the people who have lots of money, and that's heartbreaking. Because I love I love <laughs> indie studios, and honestly, I, I want them to be able to achieve the impossible. So yeah, it, it's such a huge undertaking, and there's going to be stumbling points, and I think it's I think it's at that point where the the communities of the games and the the publishers or uh, developers or marketing people they need to build that kind of connection of understanding to begin with because a lot of time people are like hype this game hype this game hype this game and then there's a ton of problems and then they're like we're sorry but instead they're like hey this is like this type of game we're welcoming your feedback this is probably going to happen or you know having kind of that set expectation ahead of time probably could have saved them a lot of face yeah absolutely but again also just like it's such a competitive space to be in mmos it's so tough for any company any company Mm-hmm. to keep a game going on so let's go on to the, to the next game on our list i don't know anything about this, this game this my favorite <laughs> um I, I just want you to explain the tagline to this world of final fantasy fan service creature collector so oh, that was the way i was trying to explain it to you because <laughs> <laughs> when so, i think of fan service i think of other things because i'm a dude you know whatever no 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 this okay is i'm hoping PG it's not related <laughs> yeah, fan service would be like um making a plushie for a favorite game to serve the fans because okay. they want it so world of final fantasy is i have a love-hate relationship with this game too i have a lot of love-hate relationships <laughs> but world of final fantasy was a fan service it was to serve that final fantasy community that always wants something new whether it's a spin-off game or a remake or a remaster mm-hmm. or whatever it is final fantasy fans are like usually full in so You know, if there's a Final Fantasy, they're going to it. So World of Final Fantasy came out, I want to say it was, it was past 2015. It was like 2015, 2016. It was around the same time of Final Fantasy 15's release. So unfortunately, this game got overshadowed, but basically you teleport. (laughs) Yes. So, and that's exactly why is because it it literally came out within like a month or two or like weeks or two. I'm going to have to look up the exact date. But I remember getting both in the mail and I played 15 because it was the more exciting one. But yeah, so basically World of Final Fantasy is a, you get teleported into this tiny world and you become this cute little chibi like version. And then like the collect, they they go through and battle and fight these monsters. And when you battle and fight them, you get them as like little additional monsters that you get to create. And the fun, like, it was just silly stuff. There was like cameos from all the different Final Fantasies, like, you know, Cloud or Squall or Terra and that sort of thing. And like, they'd all play this story and you just go through this magical Final Fantasy-esque world Mm -hmm. with all of your favorite characters collecting little minions that you can then stack on top of yourself. So I will will say, if you ever look at images of the game, just look at a battle and you can tell how adorable this game is. It appealed to kind of just the general audience of, of, of this rather than kind of the mature players. But it was so, like, you had these little chibi characters, and then they had, like, a, a bomb on top of them, and, like, you were riding on top of a Bahamut or something, like, and it was just, like, silly, just stackable madness. I'm but it was it right now. It looks very cute. Yeah, see, it's, it's, it was absolutely one of those games that it, I don't think it ever yep. intended to be the next big Final Fantasy. It was there to serve the fans that want stuff like that. But I, I loved it. It was so cute. And I remember buying it again once it came, because I bought it on PS4. And then I remember, I think it came to Switch. It was either Switch or PS5. And I bought it to to whichever console. I can't even remember now. <laughs> but it, it was absolutely just one of those games that I don't think it would have ever been able to stand alone without the Final Fantasy name and like characters. But it, it's the same the same thing. You battle uh, battle these monsters, which are you know classic Final Fantasy things. You're dealing with like a behemoth or a bomb or a, a saboteur or something like that, and then you get to collect them as like these little minions and pets and stuff. And it's the same deal. It's the same kind of creature collector. But it was fun and new, and it it's like Kingdom Hearts. That's exactly what it is. It's like Kingdom <laughs> Hearts riding on the tails of Final Fantasy. Mm-hmm. It's kind of how the world of Final Fantasy series kind of have gone. So, so yeah, that's my that's my soapbox. So it's an adorable game, <laughs> super worth the play. But it's it's just a, a fan service game for sure. On on the other hand, uh, not really fan service, but a uh, sort of a dark a dark world of video games. Let's talk about Axie Infinity. Mm, this uh, one is those... all you. <laughs> <laughs> so so here's the thing. I'm a. I'm going to I'm going to tell the listeners at home right now. I'm not a crypto bro. I don't like crypto that much. I like the idea of crypto. I don't like the applications of crypto right now. Axie Infinity is a cryptocurrency based Pokémon-ish battling 
something or other game. <laughs> I wish I could explain it more to you, but that's all I got. Basically well, what I got out of it. It's a game. You spend uh, your fake cryptocurrency money to buy axes, and you can use your axes to make money for yourself, to generate in-game currency, to make real-life currency. Somehow, that's how that works. And 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 I I understand this game performed pretty well when it came out as far as crypto games go. But I want to tell you a little fun story. Apparently, a huge portion of Filipino people played this game to the point where it was a job. People had, had full-time jobs maintaining other players' Axie farms or whatever, making passive income for that owner. And they were making income from this as a full-time job because the cost of living in the Philippines is so low. Comparison, for sure. In, in comparison to, like, us in the States. And then, I guess, a change happened or e either either the price of the currency fell or there was a hack in the, the whatever blockchain technology that this runs off of. And it tanked the price of the coin so hard that people be, there, there, there was, like, thousands of unemployed people because of this game. And insane. Oh yeah, my gosh. I, 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 read, I read an article on this. I'll, I'll, I'll try to find the article and put it in the show notes for listeners at home. But it was such a fascinating insight into the dark side of what Pokemon could be, I guess. Yeah. Of tying Pokemon to money mm -hmm. and trying to generate income from your Pokemon and your video game. And from what I understand right now, I read an article that was, I think, maybe two or three months old. It costs about $1,000 to get into playing Axie Infinity. See, I was going to ask you that, whether or not you could make money without having any to start with, and you no, just answered you my cannot. question there. So that, <laughs> see, I was thinking of it, like when you were starting that way, I was like, you know what, this game kind of looks like a fun way to get into uh, crypto. Like, I'm never mm. going to be into crypto. This is not my deal. You know, props to you all if you enjoy it, but it is <laughs> definitely my not my territory because I don't understand it, and it's just... Yeah, but what I originally saw when I saw this, I was like, oh, this could be like the cute way to get more people into crypto. But like, if you don't have that crypto investment already, it's like, right? is it just the people that enjoy crypto also enjoy creature collectors? And this is kind of <laughs> the baby of what has been born there or? Sort of, I something like that, okay. yeah. And I don't know, just ju just the cost alone. Because like, if I buy a Pokemon game, I can A, crack out my old ones, B, I can sail the high seas and do other things that aren't quite legal, legal gray area, you want to call it whatever <laughs> it is. Or I can go to Walmart and go pick up a po Pokemon Arceus for 60 bucks. Yeah. All those options are drastically cheaper than 800 to to $1,000 to play. You can buy uh, a whole new thing. computer and yeah. fucked up setup to play an emulated version of Pokemon on your computer. I, I could buy two Nintendo Switches and two copies of Pokemon Arceus for me and a friend and still have money left over. Yeah. yeah in comparison to, to getting one account in Axie Infinity. Yeah, I don't... From, from what I understand now, I don't believe the game is performing nearly as well as it was because of this. I also want because to call of the high steep, the, the fact that you have that I, I want, thousand I want, dollars. I want, I want to call it a labor shortage <laughs> because the, yeah. there, there, there is a, a, a labor shortage in this game because people who were making a full-time income for other people are now quitting in droves because they can't afford to live anymore from this game. Yeah. Just fascinatingly weird. Hey, what people do to make money, I, I support it. Y'all, y'all work your best lives. That's all I'm saying. We're all doing our best. But so I guess we're going to, to, to our next one. Uh, Monster Hunter Stories 2. Now, I've played Monster Hunter before. I have not played the Monster Hunter Stories games. Have you? I have not. So actually, when I was chatting um, with a couple of friends of mine who are big in the Monster Hunter game series, I was talking to them about this, kind of planning for this episode. And they had told me about this Monster Hunter mystery dungeon style game that mm -hmm. is monster hunter stories 2 and they they've explained it to me as like the fan service version of the pokemon collector <laughs> of the hunt monster hunter so mm -hmm. <laughs> you're learning a lot about fan service games today but yeah it, it the way that they explained it was that it was enough to be on its own kind of side it was you know very it had a lot of the monster hunter aspects like kind of similar like not necessarily similar battle system but similar weapon structures and right. similar 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 customization that sort of thing as well and just kind of turned it into a creature battle so yeah okay. they they kind of compared it a little bit like how world of final fantasy works with kind of the ff world okay i have not played it i like monster hunter i'm seeing the trailers for this and thinking it was much more of a dumbed down version of monster hunter and that's mm -hmm. fine for some people not my kind of game so i kind of skip by it 
Yeah. Um, Monster but... Hunter's like, it's, I want to love Monster Hunter. <laughs> I really do. But, and it's because a lot of my friends love it and they just can't, they, they are so involved in it. And I love that for them. But I remember buying Monster Hunter World and just being so like lost. Lost. Yeah. I was just, and I played it a couple more times yep. after that. But the series itself is so fun to watch. So mm -hmm. that is one of the ones that I've kind of picked up secondhand rather than kind of experiencing the worlds for myself. But yeah, it, it is an interesting fan base and, it, and it's got such cool and diverse like aspects of the games that, yeah, I figured it was worth the mention. So that way, you know, if people are into the kind of those fandoms and stuff too. They'd know to, to check that one out too. Yeah, I won't go too much into Monster Hunter. I've only played two of the games in the franchise. I really suggest playing Monster Hunter Rise. It that's has the new one, right? Is that the, the one new, that's on it's Switch? It's the newest one. It, it, it's on the Switch. It just came out on PC, I want to say, like one or two months ago. There's a DLC coming out this summer. I don't know if it's going to be on the PC or just the Switch, but it's much more new player friendly because I have never played Monster Hunter until I, I, had, I had bought Monster Hunter Generations Ultimate on the mm -hmm. Switch, which is one of, it's, it's a port of one of the older ones. And like you said, there's no handling whatsoever. There's no tutorial. There's no, there's nothing to get you in the game, which is kind of like how Monster Hunter normally works. But Monster Hunter Rise has that to explain to you like, hey, here's things to look out for. Here's common things. And it gives you a really good ramp up period. And I think that's just a really good entry in, in, into the series for new Ooh, players. I'll have to consider uh, that one then. Yeah, a yeah. lot of people, I'll, I've, I've seen a lot of people play it, but they kind of breeze through all that because they're used <laughs> to kind of the Monster Yeah, that world. was my first one. I really enjoyed it. I got a lot of hours in it. I got to jump back in before the DLC comes out and play some stuff for it. It's a good game. Uh, and we have a couple other games on our list here that I have never heard of. So if you want to start us off with one of those. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the other ones that I've been watching a few people play is Coromon. And Coromon, I want to say, either just came out or, again, same sort of early access to release sort of thing. But it's it, it's kind of an interesting play because the graphics are very reminiscent of the old pokemon games oh, so wow, like it really the, does so it, yeah so it, it absolutely you can tell that it is an inspiration at least with kind of the styling obviously with a more modern and kind of color you know aspect of it but it is it's, it's another one of those really cute and classic you know or modern takes on a classic game and they have kind of that monster you know taming uh you know, aspect that you know pokemon has in general so mm. the battle systems are all very similar kind of the overworld is very similar but it's made um by a smaller studio so they they've got their own kind of spin on it and own own take with it and i just i really fell in love with the art style it's on my list but i haven't actually Super gotten a cute. chance yeah it, it's really adorable and for it was like 20 dollars, i think at max yeah, it's price. 20 bucks on steam yeah so it, it, it's really affordable and it had kind of that polished feeling that i i wanted to see from another creature creator that's being released in 2022 it's also apparently on android hmm. interesting oh i don't think i, I remember I, that oh. i definitely think that taking this genre to a mobile platform is a very smart idea not just like ds ps vita switch handhelds but mobile phones this is a great genre for that because you don't need to spend all day playing you can go through do cool fights turn the game off for a while you know this game is super cute though it's very very reminiscent of of pokemon in a modern day i really like how this looks however it looks like the 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 player characters they got a they got a five head they got big skulls yeah. i gotta say they got some big domes on listen, them listen you can't exceed in every single aspect of a game come on yeah i'm, uh, I'm not no, knocking yeah, the it, art style they just got some big foreheads yeah those are those are some noggins i was gonna I was gonna let them find that one out jeff <laughs> <laughs> listen I'm, I'm looking at games too because i haven't heard of these yeah i mean it, it's just it, it's a good fun little sidestep into the same genre as kind of the classic games, just with a nice modern uplift and kind of, you know, aesthetic in general. And that that's very similar with the next game as well. So the other game that I was kind of chatting about, I haven't played it myself, but I've watched some content on it. It's called Nexomon 2. That was another one that just kind of hit the rails in this kind of very vibrant and modern art style creature collector game. So when you look at the game, I want to say it's like, because I've never played these and I'm sorry, I'm not a Zelda fan. Is it Link's Awakening that I think that I think it's the similar art style? It's yes. got those kind of very like bright colors and sort of things. And it gave me kind of that Link's Awakening feel of a creature. And that's why I really wanted to mention this one because it looks really exciting. And I've actually got this one on my wish list that I'm going to pick up eventually. It shares a lot of the same aspects of the other creature collectors. It has its, you know, regular elemental aspects of each Pokemon or each Mon, you want to call them. But it gives it kind of this adorable thing with like, there's like products that you can make. And then there's also like just really exciting and pretty visuals. 
like I think one of the one of the uh, streamers that I was watching who was covering some of this was like showing me this like super big like lava area that had like a volcano area in it and it was mm -hmm. just like super pretty I mean there was just like so much stuff to look at and I'm a very visual person when it comes to a lot of these games like I I am very attracted to really just bright and vibrant art or just really unique art styles and this one kind of it, it caught my attention immediately and I was like oh this is cute and it reminded me of kind of Link's Awakening and I was chatting about you know that with another friend so yeah those this two art they're... style is very nice it I is yeah it, it's really and it's and it's different enough like it's it gives kind of a new spin on what those graphics look like because we haven't really gotten I mean, I guess maybe the closest would be like X and Y for that mm -hmm. style. But yeah, we haven't had that in a long time. And it kind of plays to that nostalgia, I think. It 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 looks like the art style looks like a blend of what the original Link's Awakening would look like if it was hand drawn. Yeah. Mixed with Pokemon. Because mm -hmm. it doesn't quite look like the new version of Link's Awakening, the Switch yeah. version. It just looks like a, a more hand-drawn version mixed with Pokemon. It's it like looks a really cutesier good. version. It's but not, cute, not always yeah. It's got some darker elements and stuff to it, but it is a very vi like it is a very vibrant, whereas a lot of the other games are kind of muted and, you know, mm -hmm. uh, regular scale or monochrome, that sort of thing. So, yeah, this um, is very bright and colorful. It also, is, yeah. It's also on, uh, on Android, apparently, too. Oh, man, I'm just finding all the mobile games. I'm, a, I'm an <laughs> Apple person, so <laughs> none Ooh. of this stuff applies nah, to fine. me. But that's funny. I didn't realize that. I don't even know how I... I mean, I, I take that back because I have Final Fantasy VII on my on my iPhone that I play on, like, flights and stuff. So <laughs> it's I was about a, to say, how do you play oh, these also games? also on the Switch. It's a, it's, it's, so it's apparently called Nexomon Extinction. Yeah. So that is one, this, yeah. So the, I think they, is it a second iteration of something? There there was like- some, I'm guessing the, St the Steam version just says Extinction. So I'm guessing it's just not two, which is oh, called okay. Extinction so for the second just version. The it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So that that was the one that they had recommended to me. And it was just like, I remember just being so pulled in by the by the art style. And it just, I w it seemed very playable. Like there wasn't any like obvious kind of like hurdles or kind of like, I don't know. It just, it was, it was the same style, but it was- just it felt new and it felt vibrant mm -hmm. and that was enough to keep me so now that we've talked about a bunch of similar games that are currently out for your perusal listeners at home and for us too because i'm probably gonna pick up next month looks kind of cute actually yeah obviously we have uh pokemon's not going anywhere pokemon's gonna be on for for quite a long time i think and we have the newest games coming out is it th this fall or next fall i want to say it's this fall actually uh, i think pretty so. sure it's this fall uh, I can look. We have Scarlet and Violet, which are coming out whenever Krav looks it up. And we don't know a lot about this game yet. We, we've seen a couple trailers here and there. We haven't seen a lot of hardcore gameplay trailers. Mm -hmm. It looks like a slight blend of the Sword and Shield and Arceus, which I haven't played Arceus, so I can't, I can't attest to the gameplay of that. But I do know how the game works. And it looked interesting. It wasn't my kind of game, but, you know, it looked interesting as, as a spin-off Pokemon title. But like what what do you want to see in 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 a new version of Pokemon in in your ideal Pokemon world? What 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 comes out in Scarlet and Violet? So, honestly, <laughs> the cat Pokemon. I I I got so excited. Like I was I, I had kind of been tuned off of Pokemon for a while and I was just mm. like, "Nah, I'll look at the art when it comes up." Like I was not looking for news. And honestly, somebody had shared the 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 cat, the the grass cat. Like and I'm just mm. like I want, I want the weed cat. Like, come on. <laughs> so he, he just kind of like, okay. So I was like, oh, he's got a cute Pokemon. All right, I'm going in. And now I start looking into it. And it does feel very, I, I would agree. I think it looks like a combination of what Shield, uh, Shield and Sword and Arceus, or not Arceus. Yeah, Arceus would be. Yeah. So it, it had kind of that open world aspect from what we were able to tell. Obviously they haven't given us much with it, but I like kind of the updated graphics. I like that they're kind of tuning into this like open world aspect still but yeah it, it's hard to tell because we don't have a lot of information right now we just kind of have the hype and the name and kind of a for me when i saw the trailer i was like okay we're gonna get another another rehash of sword and shield they're gonna phone in another version just like they have for the past few gens add a couple things here and there that only stick for one one generation like there was the what was it? The X evolution. And then we have mega Pokemon yeah. and like, you know, it's all, it's always like one gimmick that never moves to the next genre. I would like to see just a more difficult game. I think that the like sword and shield was just such a snooze fest. I don't think I've, I ever failed a single trainer battle in the entire game, which I'm not asking for like a fire emblem, permadeath, crazy difficult role-playing game. I want some challenging, you know? Yeah. 
and having having your entire team get experience at the same time, I'm fine with that change. It was a good quality of life change compared to yeah. the older gens. But it saved us a lot of grinding. Yeah, yeah. But there's just there's just no there's no challenge involved. I know my type matchups. I get a good Pokemon as a fire type. It it rocks through the game for whatever how long it needs to go through. Then I swap my water type. I rock in with that one until I switch to the next one, so on and so forth. There's no difficulty in these in these fights. And I think that if they want to step it up to a more mature audience, they really need to dial in on how to make these trainer fights difficult and engaging and not leaving that for the post game. So, That's what something they've always done is leave it for the post game. Yeah. And I think and I know you had mentioned that you haven't played Arceus, but Arceus is actually a step up in the grand scheme of the Pokemon games. Mm -hmm. It doesn't handhold you the way that all the other games does. And that's kind of what gives me a little bit of faith when they're going back to Violet and Scarlet is because they've made like, don't get me wrong, there's a lot of things wrong with Arceus. There's a lot of good things with Arceus as well. But they are kind of pulling this from that. And they're I, I'm hopeful that they're going to take kind of a little bit of the hand-holding away, still obviously make it accessible and make it, you know, accessible for, you know, difficult players or, you know, beginners who don't want the challenge. But I, I hope to see kind of a, a marrying of that skill because, like, the way you had to approach Pokemon in, in uh, Arceus is completely different. You can either, you know, try to battle them and weaken them. You can throw a Pokeball from the shadows. You can do all of these other things. And I think if they kind of blended the two games, give us the accessibility of short, uh, Sword and Shield, with the uniqueness of Arceus, and I think it could give us a good new starting point and a new jump pad for the rest of the generations to come after. Mm -hmm. What do you think about having different difficulty options in a new Pokemon game if there was an easy, medium, hard mode? Personally, I am all for accessibility. If it okay. makes somebody being able to play the game, 100%. So I'm there for the story, the easy, and the normals. I don't play on a hard level, so it's hard for me to advocate as much for those because you <laughs> okay. can still play the game. You may not enjoy the game. Right. So yeah, I would say on a general level, if that was an option to either have it or not, put it in 100%. That way people can kind of pick where they go from there. I like that idea. Like I, for me, I like more difficult games, don't get me wrong, but I also do want to have that accessibility. Like we talked about Monster Hunter earlier, there's no accessibility at all for Monster Hunter. It's just like either you know it or you don't know it. I'm totally fine with having like an easy, medium, hard mode for Pokemon for, you know, new players or casual players or those who don't want to put in the, the, the effort into like trying to figure out, you know, typing and, and what I just want to just grind through the cute Pokemon. That's totally fine. For me, I don't want to grind a million for a million hours to get like the perfect EVs. Mm -hmm. But you know what? I want to go into a fight and be like, oh, I might actually lose this fight. You know what I yeah. mean? Like I want, I want actual challenge. Having that sense of like, oh my yeah. gosh, I actually have to think about what I'm doing rather than yeah. just push buttons. Yeah. Yep. Then just like, all right, cool. My 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 first starter wipes out three other Pokemon. Then I swap types to the next one, and then I'm done for the day. Mm -hmm. I just think it'd be it could be such a a more interesting take on how it works, and and give it uh, just a, a better match from for a more mature age. Because let's be honest majority of Pokemon fans are probably going to be in our age group. We're probably yeah. going to be in our late 20s or early 30s because that's when the games came out for us as kids. Mm -hmm. And we're still we playing still have now. that nostalgia generation. Yeah. And they're in the process. Like, it's hard because I, I see where they're going with things because they have to, like, unlike Monster Hunter, Pokemon obviously is a, is a much wider known kind of phenomenon in general. So, like, obviously, as the more people know it, the more accessible something has to be. So I, I can see that. But... I think one of the biggest things here would just be, like, are we willing to trade a year or two, like, difference in kind of, like, postpone between each game if they mm -hmm. were to add a lot of these features to the game? Is that something you think that the community can live through? Because, like, right Absolutely. now, Pokemon Pokemon is one of those games, and, and I believe so as well, but it's one of those things that's been around for a while, and the name is still there, so I think they can go kind of that extra time. So if they're willing to put in the time, there's really no excuse. And that's kind of why I was thinking of it that way. Like, they know that they don't have to push out a new game every other year. Like, they could take an extra year on it and be more accessible to more people, and then, therefore, they grow even larger. So, like, there's a lot of, like, fundamental things, like... It's like, because in a lot of fandoms, you can't do that. If you go irrelevant for two years, you're done. So mm. I think Pokemon is is in a strategic place because they are well-known pretty much throughout the world. Yeah, like I'm, I'm looking right now at, at the, the releases for all the Pokemon games, and they, they've kept to that two-year window for yeah. almost entirely until 2016 when Sun and Moon came out. Because from, from 2016 to now, it's been released at least every year with a mainline Pokemon game. Yeah. Which is impressive, don't be wrong. But again, like 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 I said earlier, that every year effort has been a bunch of Pokemon games that have not been 
anywhere near impactful as you think they are. Yeah. Like we talked earlier about, about Sun and Moon and Ultra Sun Ultra Moon. Those came out one year apart. I never played them. I have heard yeah. no one talk about them at all. I couldn't tell you the book went in those games. I have no clue. Yeah. I have then, Sun. I think it's sitting on my <laughs> mantle. Somewhere over me. there. Yeah. And like Let's Go Eevee came out in 2018. Sure, mm -hmm. that was fun. I like that. And then right after that came out Sword and Shield. I think that was the only passable thing because Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee was such a different take yeah. compared to a, Sword and Shield. Oh, it was yeah. a Some phone. It was a phone. Not phoned in. It was, it was a dumbed down, easier version for nostalgia. Yes. It's for nostalgia and for, mm -hmm. and for a younger audience, which I'm yeah. totally fine with that. They're fun games. But I guess from, from 2016 all the way until now, it's been one release every year except for 2020, which was the DLC yeah. for Sword and Shield, which I didn't play it. I yeah. don't know if you play, we talked about it. You didn't, you didn't play it. Listener at home, if you played it, let us know. Just send us an email. Tell us about how much you love DLC or hate the DLC. That's fine too. But like, never played it. And then 2021 was a re release of Diamond and Pearl, which I believe did okay. It did numbers yeah. wise. I didn't play it because I didn't care enough about Diamond. I have Pearl Diamond. I've been I've been actually playing through Diamond in preparation <laughs> for like I was like oh I haven't played this series in a while so I was picking that up. But yeah, it's, uh, it's I played Diamond window. and Pearl. I just didn't care that much about that generation, so I kind of skipped it. Yeah. Especially trying to pay. I skipped it the first time, so this is me trying it now. <laughs> I, I, just just to call out Nintendo, stop making remakes for sixty dollars. Come on, yeah. dudes. You're breaking me over here. I can buy a remake on a Steam on Steam for forty bucks. I can buy a great indie game for thirty. Don't even pay sixty bucks for a game. You can buy and five good indie games for thirty yeah, bucks. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, it and and that's kind of you know kind of the direction I wanted to jump into was like this mega company has the ability to do more with their games, but they are so tight in on that window that mm -hmm. that's what they're putting out, whether they're in love with the product or not. I feel I feel like perhaps Nintendo and Game Freak are worried that, that that taking the Pokemon franchise and slowing it down to make a new product will end up putting them in that same hole that Metroid Prime 4 is in, which, as we know, has been in development for t eight, ten years now? Something a like long that. time. And it keeps getting pushed back and pushed back. And you know what? I agree with Nintendo when, when they say that a good game takes time and crunch is unnecessary. But I think that they're worried that if they take too much time on Pokemon is not going to be a good product, which is a shame. Be because It could be reversed. Like, I mean, yeah. taking that extra <laughs> year, especially with how conditions are. Like, I would much rather buy a game two years from now from a studio that's not killing their employees. Absolutely. Uh, and and I, I don't know the working conditions. I can't speak on them, but... Uh, I feel like there's a lot of pressure there, wh whether Absolutely. they mean to in the workplace or not, just because of that window. So it's something that kind of is something to think about. Like, could they push back a year and still be as popular? And I think they could. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a matter of I, will they. I don't think that Pokemon will ever lose popularity. I think they're more worried about if they take too long on making a new game, they're going to get self-conscious about how good this game will be and continue to push it back and back and back. And I think that's the issue that they they are worried about. That's my opinion. I could be wrong entirely. I don't know. From what I understand, the work conditions at Game Freak and Nintendo are pretty good. They don't focus a lot on crunch. I could be wrong. Hey, Nintendo, if you want to reach out and like talk to me personally and like fly <laughs> me to Japan, I'm in for it. I got a friend in Japan. I'd love to go and visit him. But anyway, like I don't. I, I think it's, they're, they're more worried about getting caught in that trying to innovate and never innovating cycle. And I think that could be a potential reason as, as to why they're so worried about making a new release that's so wildly different or skipping that two-year like window for these games a lot of it is like looking at the player base a lot too you could tell that to an indie game lover and honestly we'll be like yeah give it give it to us in four years we're we're on board we got this absolutely but if you tell that to somebody who's waiting for a triple a no it's two weeks late this is bull crap like <laughs> you are the worst people and, and that's what it is it's like it's bal it's a balancing act between those people of who are okay waiting and who are the instant gratification people. And yep. it's like, when you deal with that, it, it can pull a studio in two different ways. And and that, I feel it could be super dangerous in that regard because like, they're if they're trying to appease everyone, they're not going to appease anyone at all. Never like, will it, do that, it, no. It's never going to work for them. So I think it's a matter of them internally figuring out whether or not it's going to be like worth it to, to push it back and kind of finding the ability to see that like, if they did this, this could happen. It's it's that imaginary thinking, you know, mm. that they've got to get behind. And I know that's really difficult from a business standpoint because obviously you're in the business to make profit and, and that sort of right. thing too. So it's kind of marrying those two principles. 
And then on the other hand, when it comes to Pokemon games or Pokemon-like games coming out in the future, I haven't seen a lot of new games coming out soon in the genre. I did a casual look here and there. I, like I said, I didn't find a whole lot that was sort of in this same monster battling genre that was really shining a light on something new except for one game i'm gonna go ahead and give a content warning for our listeners at home this game does involve sweatshops slavery <laughs> i don't know how to find this but but uh but hold on all right chat animal cruelty i guess is another trigger uh, um, yeah, I say I chat? Say slavery animal cruelty. slavery probably. sweat shopping animal cruelty uh it's called pal world pal world is <laughs> god it's a fever dream of a video game. It has not come out yet. We've had a couple trailers so far of this game. I'll go ahead and read the, the, the Steam description. Pal World is a brand new multiplayer open world survival crafting game where you can befriend and collect mysterious creatures called Pal in a vast world. Make your pals fight, build, farm, and work in factories. Now, that doesn't sound that bad it sounds like a weird take on like a terraria minecraft whatever Audition sort of game something, yeah but then you watch the trailer and there are pokemon making guns and you're just like shooting pokemon with like assault rifles there's gun. like a there's a, there's a brief clip yeah. that shows a bunch of pokemon working in, a, in, a, in, like, a, in like a gun manufacturing sweatshop it, it's a, i i have a lot of feelings oh, I'm, about this I'm watching the, the trailer's playing right now in the background and it shows this big like, imagine if you took Totoro and Pikachu and fused it together and gave him a minigun. I just saw that in the trailer, and yeah. I, it just, I got lost for a second trying to figure out what I'm looking at. Like, it's, that's the kind of game we're talking about right here. This this is the dark side of what Pokemon could be. Just and and a, we talked about crypto, if that gives you any yeah. indication how dark this is. <laughs> yeah, I, okay, so... I, I try to look at games subjectively. Like I try to pull myself out of this gift. They're building an actual rocket in one of the gifts on the yes. Steam oh, page. Oh, it's like it's an FPS game. Like yes, and that's what it's like. I'm so confused. So I have many feelings about this game. So I, I try to pull myself out of things. So like obviously, like if you look at things from a fantasy environment, that and just reading the bio, it looks cool. But we are all humans and deal with a lot of stuff going on in our real lives. And this feels a little too real to me in the worst way. And that is, it, it has such unique and cool elements and cool art style. But the way that this is executed just feels very wrong. And yeah, it, it, it's basically what, it, what you explained before is how I would explain that Pikachu creature. It's a, it's a fever dream. It is a fever dream. Yeah, it's it's aggressive. It's aggressive. <laughs> and it's cutesy aggressive. It feels like happy tree friends. Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. It feels like happy tree friends. And if you're a millennial, I hope you understand this. Gen Zers, <laughs> I'm so sorry. This is a thing from our past. It happy. It reminds me of happy tree friends. The cutesy murder. And, that, I, and that's I, what I, I... I will at least say, I don't believe this game is M-rated. No, I, I don't no think so There is no blood or guts or anything like that. When you shoot enemies, whether it's a Pokemon or a human, they just ragdoll. Like in it, any okay, other like game. It's Fortnite. It's Fortnite. It's like Fortnite, yeah. Yeah, like so it's, it's it's cartoony. It's not gory. It's not graphic. I want to say probably at worst it'll probably be like PG thirteen or whatever. Probably, 14. but like I'm, I'm looking at it. There's, 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 a, there's a gif of the player with with a Pokemon shooting a, a handgun on his head while he's shooting an assault rifle, and like yeah. the enemies just ragdoll. That's all they do. There's no there's no violence like that. It's just. I feel like all the core elements of this game look really, really good. You know, catching monsters and survival crafting is really good. It's very popular right now. And, you know, base building is really cool, too. Did you have to add the guns, though? Yeah, the, like, I, the every, guns feel very every... misplaced. And, like, and, I, I, I'm not saying guns are bad. I, yeah. Gun we're, 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 we're not, we're not, we're not going to get into, Yeah, we're not talking um, about gun control. We're just saying that in this cutesy world it feels of these very fantastical foreign. monsters, it's just so weird to see that in there. Yeah. So, it is, it's like it's like a fan service of Fortnite and Pokemon. I, I don't really yeah. know how else to explain it. Yeah. It's just, it feels out of place. I mean, if y'all want to play it and tell us about it, please do. I don't think either of us are going to be... Uh, play in this anytime in our future maybe I'm, out of morbid I'm, curiosity i'm gonna keep a close eye on it will i buy it probably not not unless there's something i really want to get out of this but like i'm keeping a close eye on it because every time i forget about it something new comes out and i go what is what am i looking at right now what is this <laughs> 
just such a weird game. It is know. very weird, yeah. But that so that that's it. That's all we have to talk about today about Pokemon. Unless you have anything to add, Crab, no, I, I think anything. we've covered everything from A to B and X, Y, and, and all the tangents include. <laughs> we've covered every gem. We've covered every color. We've covered every metallic metal, mm-hmm. I guess. And I guess both colors so far. There's more colors. There's five colors now. Yeah, there's five colors. We're bad. I'm bad. <laughs> um, <laughs> we know gaming. That's science and art. Sorry. Yeah, it's fine. I play video games, all right? I talk for a living. Um, So let's go ahead and dive into, uh, what are you playing this week, Krev? What games have have gotten your attention in the past week or two? So I'm on an indie kick right now. So I have been playing a couple of actually really exciting new indie games. So Lost Nova is one that I've been playing recently. And it's like, it's like a cutesy don't starve together. Like that paper kind of 2D kind of effect. But basically you play as this astronaut or something who crashes her ship on an alien island. And she basically has to find a way to repair her ship to get going. And the, the whole area of this game is just kind of exploring this planet that you've landed on at where there's sentient apples who are selling apples to their friends and apple <laughs> pies and tarts. It's just, it's a lot of very silly humor, but it's okay. like, I cracked up at it and I have a pretty, I have a pretty serious like sense of humor. So like not a lot of like the, the silly stuff is going to get to me, but I was I was giggling playing it. It had a lot of very smart and cute, silly humor in it. Mm -hmm. Um, And the art style was really great. It was like, it's puzzles and collecting and kind of just like, it had little shop elements. It was just really cutesy and fun. I loved it. And then the other game that I've been kind of playing a little bit on here and there is V Rising, which I don't know if you've heard of this one yet. It's that vampire like Diablo. I've seen bits and pieces about it. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I have never played, I'll preface this by saying I've never played a Diablo game. So I'm not really super well known in like kind of the top down action RPG scene, but it, it reminds me of like Vampire the Masquerade met Vel. So it has like kind of the battle, obviously, to kind of fight some stuff off. So it has kind of the Diablo, you know, esque style skill bar at the bottom. And you basically uh, have to build this base and protect yourself from the sun because you start burning in the sun and start losing HP. And I was like, the, the different mechanics and kind of you have this like strategy of like building, you know, this safe place where you can put your coffins and kind of resource management and gathering. It had kind of all of those fun things that I loved about Valheim with kind of a fun little like vampire twist. So mm-hmm. I've really enjoyed it so far. So that's the, those are the two that I've been focusing the most on. For me, I've been playing a lot of uh, Hard Space Shipbreaker. I have no idea what that is. <laughs> yeah, so so I really saw the trailer for this, I want to say last year, and I forgot it came out because I thought the trailer was super interesting. I forgot the game came out. And it just hit Game Pass within the last week or so. And I picked it up because I was like, ooh, this is the game I talked about, or I saw earlier. It is a game where you are disassembling uh, spaceships. You are a junker, a salvager. They're called shipbreakers in this universe. You are in massive debt to this, like, global, not global, this, like, huge corporation that basically owns your soul. You're, like, 1.2 billion credits in debt. And you have to work air quotes here on taking apart ships which doesn't sound that interesting so the 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 part that's fun is that there's a danger to these ships because you have to figure out okay how do i take out the engine properly how do i handle fuel canisters how do i depressurize the interior cabin so i don't get blown out of here or get you know sucked into like a a crack in the wall and die how do i deal with like coolant and electrical systems and the game scales in how complex these ships get which makes it more interesting and more challenging but it's also just like a huge vibe just like sit there and like look at a ship and figure out oh, cool i can t- cut these points here and like use tethers to pull this out this way and like separate this and get into the reactor and like take out the power and then come back to the reactor and pull that out and put it in, the, in this area and then pull the thruster out it, it gets so in depth but in a fun way where you don't need to like write down like complex schematics of how to, how to take a show apart. It's just like, okay, cool. This part has this mechanic. This part has this mechanic to like figure this out. And it's just fun. It's a lot of fun. I played it on stream a few times. I got my, my best friend, Alex, he got COVID uh, over the past week, RIP. He's doing fine. But he, he saw me play it on stream. He picked it up and he has been playing every day in, for the past like four days. See, don't He's you blown. love that responsibility knowing that you just wrecked somebody's life? Oh, I love it. He, <laughs> in the best way, like, I mean. He like he told me, he was like, hey, man, I took two days off because I'm trying to, you know, I took two days off work so I'm trying to deal with COVID. I'm like, oh, yeah, 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 dude, like, feel better, whatever, it's fine. And I'm like, that night, he's like, bro, I started playing sh- uh, Shipbreaker and I'm so addicted to this. And I was like, good for you, bud. Yep. The next day, he's like, bro, I was up till 5 a.m. taking oh, no. up ships last night. <laughs> and I was like, bro, 
oh, you have co- you, your fiance, and your son all have COVID. You should be resting. You took time off work to rest. He was like, bro, I can't stop myself. <laughs> and like today, I love he- those games, and I hate those games. <laughs> I love that feeling of just like I have to keep playing this. Yeah, he I love he, that. he is he is lost in the sauce for this game. Oh. And the other game I've been playing recently, it. So I haven't played Monster Sanctuary. We talked about earlier. I've also been playing American Trucking Sim. God, the truckers. <laughs> I, I play. I play a lot of weird games, listeners at home and Krev. Okay. That is I play okay. a lot of weird stuff. I have I have my tastes. I guess I like digital manual labor and not real manual labor. I don't know how to explain <laughs> this. Because like Hearts of Shipbreaker, I'm doing manual labor. <laughs> like fantasy game. American you're Trucking not Sim. That manual I'm labor doing life. manual labor. But like okay, <laughs> I have a steering wheel. I have I have like the, the pedals and whatnot. You know, I have my I have a stream deck that I I've, I've outfitted with a bunch of keys for all my truck, the functions, like my blinkers, my wipers, and like my lights and all that. I get in the zone, okay? <laughs> I, I love that. There there are in-game radio stations. There, there are fan-made radio stations for American and Euro Trucking Sim I love that, that sound like real radio stations. And when I first started playing, I was playing late at night, and I was, because there a lot of this uh, community is, is European-based, and they're just playing, you know, like regular music and whatnot with like occasional little like fake commercial ad breaks to promote Discord servers and whatnot. I was playing in the daytime a few days ago, they have actual daytime radio hosts. Oh, who I give don't you like, doubt it. Like news information about, uh, on traffic in their like the server they host for multiplayer worlds, and I'm like, what are they talking about? Like this is so in depth. So I I'm gonna I'm this. gonna jump in here because this is going to be a really funny connection. I actually used to be a DJ in second in Second Life <laughs> and The Sims Online when I, oh. I was 11 years old when I first started DJing online for online radio stations that were hosted <laughs> by people playing the game and we would host on location we would do all that stuff and I was the voice of their advertisements a lot as well and I ran a show three or four times a week and it's the wow. same kind of thing so I was like oh no he's bringing this up I can't not talk about this <laughs> I, I had no idea because like I said I was playing at night and you know nighttime I'm in Florida so you know nighttime for me is like super early in, in, in European time for most people and so a lot of it's just like pre-recorded sessions but you know one day I finished work early I hopped in a play and I'm hearing like actual like actual voices 